help women save lives and peacefully end abortion where you live. I can tell you exactly uh, what would happen. Um, The infant would be delivered. Uh, The infant would be kept comfortable. Uh, The infant would be resuscitated if if that's what the uh, mother and the family desired. You were serious about that? Be inspired to change hearts and minds by joining over one million volunteers taking part in the global movement happening in your neighborhood. She says, pray that I can get through this abortion. And I said, oh, no, no. So she went ahead and went into the abortion clinic. And she just came out. She told me, I'm not going to get the abortion. We just had a baby shaved. But we had a baby saved and never to go. Pray the Lord. This is the 40 Days for Life podcast with your host, Sean Carney. Hello, and thank you for joining us today on the 40 Days for Life podcast. I'm Sean Carney, the president of 40 Days for Life and your host for this podcast, which is dedicated to helping you end abortion where you live. And welcome to the week that changed the world, as Fulton Sheen famously called Holy Week. This is a Holy Week themed podcast on kind of the negative side of Holy Week, and that is Judas and abortion. That is the topic of this week's podcast, Judas and Abortion. So we will take you uh, through that as we all journey through Holy Week as uh, the end of our Lenten journey to grow closer to Jesus Christ as we celebrate uh, the, the highest moment of human history, which is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. They have not found his bones. Our faith is pinned to the fact that he did rise from the dead, That is a fundamental reality. He is, by the way, the only one to ever do so. I once had a professor said in college who said, ah, people are raised, they they rise from the dead all the time. You know, and I was like, wow, name one. I'm I'm interested in this list. Um, So anyways, Jesus actually did rise from the dead. And that is what we pin our hope to as we struggle and fight in a very hostile and and pagan culture um, against the attacks on the dignity of the human person. And that is why Judas is so important to us during a Holy Week and in this fight uh, to end abortion, because the attacks on human dignity, um, you know, we believe are all time high. I know many generations that have gone before us uh, have said that and, and looked around, um, but with our technology with our efficiency, um, we're able to do it on just such a mass scale. So uh, it's very, very important that we finish Lent strong, that we participate with Jesus. We don't observe Good Friday as something that just happened a long time ago or Easter Sunday as something that happened a long time ago, but we live through these events and walk with our Lord um, through Holy Thursday, through Good Friday, His suffering, uh, through the silence of of Holy Saturday when he is resting um, in the tomb, and then ultimately uh, the unbelievable rejoicing of his resurrection um, as we pray for uh, our own resurrection one day and entrance into eternal life with him. So beautiful, beautiful time of year, uh, d- d- beautiful time, beautiful, specifically a beautiful week to grow closer uh, to Jesus Christ. So uh, very uplifting but insightful podcast we have for you today. And somebody who is always uplifting and insightful is Mr. Steve Carlin. Steve, happy Holy Week. Happy Holy Week, Sean. I'm glad we are here. It seems like we just kicked off Lent, uh, you know, a week ago, but here we are nearing the culmination of it. So a great time, certainly, uh, to, I guess, uh, Whatever it was that we set out to heal in ourselves or to let the Lord heal in us spiritually during this Lent, this is the final push. This is this is get ready, make straight the way of the Lord before we celebrate the resurrection. Yes, it's a it's a great week. And you recently were given great news. <laughs> um, you're, we can just skip to Easter Sunday with this news Steve, <laughs> because you have been waiting and waiting. This is a huge announcement, not maybe in the history of Steve Carlin's soul. But certainly in the history of your of your natural life here on Earth, because things are about to change for you and they're going to change big time. After 28 years on the waiting list for Green Bay Packers season tickets, my number came up this week. (laughs) 
<laughs> Steve has been called. Not to the afterlife. <laughs> Thank God he's still here. But he has been called. His number has been chosen. That's kind of scary. Did they use that wording in the letter from Lambeau Field? Your number has been chosen. No, but you would have loved it because it comes in an envelope. First of all, it's registered mail. I had a sign for the letter letting me know that it was time. <laughs> yeah, am I being sued? No, man, you got yeah. hacker tickets. <laughs> the mailman and I had to talk about it. It was great. He was very excited. He was telling me where he is on the list. Every stereotype that any of the listeners or viewers oh, has about Wisconsin gosh. is absolutely true. So yeah, we had a great conversation. And then there's like this gold foil embossed card that lets you know you're up. And then <laughs> and then that like sort of like gets you excited before they they drop the smack down and they tell you just what these season tickets are going to cost you. Yeah. So you mentioned that. Now you revealed to me, we will not reveal on the podcast because that's secretive information uh, regarding the Packers. The tickets actually aren't that expensive. I, I was surprised. That, I mean, you waited 28 years and it's it's not like these things are like, $5,000 or something. I mean, it, it's actually amazing how I was surprised as a non-Packer fan, but someone who respects the Packers and what they mean for sports. I, I, I just, I, I didn't think it was that expensive. So you actually have a shot. You have a decision to make. Basically. I've got a decision to make. Yeah. And it doesn't help that I married a Bears fan. That is, um, you know, negotiations so are is ongoing. Is Laura the problem here? Like, does she need to be <laughs> either ignored or influenced greatly by an outside source? The, I mean, anyone who wants has the ability to get a hold of my wife and wants to put in a good word, that'd be helpful. She, you know, she's she's the one that's being reasonable here. She, we got it, and and she said, "So, what do you think we should do?" And I said, "I am Steve. Steve. Steve there's no room for reason." We <laughs> that's what I told her. Years. This is an irrational spontaneous emotional decision that you have to take i couldn't make a rational decision if i tried you know you hear those sort of stereotypes <laughs> about like the little girls grow up dreaming of their wedding day when i was like 11 to 39 years old that this was the day the day that that letter came was the day that i dreamed about my entire childhood and laura's got a point where she's like i don't know it, it's not really like the most sensible time in life we got all these kids it's it's not yeah recklessly yeah. expensive but it's not super responsible either there's a lot of these different things where you know it, you could make a good case for it not making sense and here's my analogy sean you know if i were on the waiting list for two or three years i probably don't take these tickets but do you remember the Seinfeld episode where Elaine had the card and if she got 24 punches on the card, she got the free sub and she didn't even like the sub sandwiches. They were bad sandwiches, but she was yes. eating them so that she could finally get to the 25th and she would become the submarine captain and get that free sandwich. There's a little yes. bit of that going on in the Carlin household right now. OK, but I think it's more than that because she didn't really like the sandwiches. You love the Packers and you're That's from true. Wisconsin. And I know because knowing you personally, you made the strategic decision years ago. You're not moving from Wisconsin. You stayed there. You hate the cold. You complain about it more than anybody on Earth that I know. And yet you're like, you know what? I'm from here. I love my home state. Having miserable weather is part of it. We have the Packers. We have the Brewers. I'm raising my kids like this. So you're there. So I agree with you on the raising kids. Mary Lisa and I go through this. Like we're not in the stage where we can buy dumb stuff we don't need. So you're like, why didn't this come upon me in a decade? Right. That'd be perfect. 10 yeah. years from now. Uh, but it didn't. But you waited 28 years now because I think the tickets are affordable. Uh, but they're, they're not just like astronomical. Plus, you can sell them if you're like, I don't I'm not going to you know, you can sell you're in the club. You're you the want. guy like you to get Packer tickets. You need to know a guy and you become the guy. And that's just cool. That's not that shows. I think that my entire Lenten journey has failed, that that matters to me. But like, it's pretty, <laughs> pretty cool. You are the guy now after this. Lent, as of this Lent, you're the guy <laughs> who can get tickets. Now, I, of course, am only looking out for myself in this. And I realize that if you get season tickets to the Packers, I can go to a Packer game again. I've only been to one and it was with you and it was phenomenal. And they played the Cowboys. So that was just like perfect. And we've shown those, those uh, amazing uh, pictures. Um, now I'll buy my ticket from you, Steve. I'm not going to like, <laughs> you, you, know, you can, uh, I'll buy, I'll buy you a bratwurst in the stadium. But um, so I, 
I sh- I should be discounted for Laura. So if you're like, you know, Sean said we should get the tickets. I waited 28 years. Laura is completely, it's it's responsible for her to say he's an idiot. He just wants to go to a cowboy game in Lambeau. And that's completely true. So I should be discounted from the discussion because I come with a, a hidden agenda like many people in our country. Um, and so I don't count, but yes. I want to tell you on this podcast and I want the listeners to email. So let's, let's set the table. They're affordable. If you don't want them, you can you can sell them. So the, the financial thing to me isn't a isn't a huge holdup. Uh, I'm surprised she's not bringing up time. Oh, that's so that's you, definitely part of it. Yeah. Okay, you're leaving me every Sunday to to roam around Lambo with your with your buddies. Um, <laughs> she's like the the season takes place during 40 days for life. Like that came up. <laughs> <laughs> that the games are on Sunday. You can't go to a football game on Sunday. Okay. That's a We've good got point, one of though. our best campaigns is in Green Bay. But here's, exactly. here's another... Wait, I think Wisconsin will be abortion-free. I would take the positive thing. I think Wisconsin over time is going to be abortion-free. So, you know, you're not going to have a local vigil. Uh, I, where you start, Steve, I want to say email us at podcast at 40daysforlife.com. Yes, Steve, after 28 years, you deserve it. Get the tickets. No, Steve, you're a loser. Um don't do it. My so here's another interesting wrinkle about it is my brother Cameron, who you've met, he's yes. 10 years younger than me to the day. And he uh he got on the list at the same time. And so lo and behold, my four seats would be right next to his four seats. So the oh, Carlin is... family would become a dynasty. We would be like the Genghis Khan of Wisconsin with eight contiguous seats, and they're good seats, they're like 25 yard line. Um, this is great. And I asked him, I called him and I said, what are you guys going to do? And his answer was, I didn't even ask my wife. The envelope is back in the mail. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So uh, first off, that's weird. He's 10 years younger, but he got on the list. What was he like in the crib? And he submitted his he name. He was on one the year list? old. He was one year old. And okay. my parents put him on. That's the only way to do it. I was well, 11. That's... So yeah, they just got to it late for you. Okay. That's another reason you should do it. You've, you've been scammed out of these last uh, many years. Cause they I'm a put victim. You on when you were one, you are a victim. I'm going to go big picture for you, Steve. All right, we've seen a rise in divorce. We've seen a rise in contraception, abortion. We now have the transgender. We've redefined marriage. All these attacks on the family, all these attacks, I think, on just positive recreation, hanging out with your daughters, hanging out with your sons, all of this. And your family is going to have this like perpetual until the day you die. You'll have these two rows at Lambeau Field. You can use them. You cannot use them. But that is going to be like a cornerstone of of getting together. You could have a relative or a child one day leave their faith. But they'll be like, you know, I I want to go to a game with dad. And that's the time to evangelize them at the Packer game because they keep coming home for the game. So I think this is a family recreation issue. I'm, of course, justifying this for, for you. Um. This is a pro family, healthy, fun thing that is totally ingrained in the state of Wisconsin. If you've ever been there, this is like a it's not like you live in Phoenix or something and you're like the Diamondback tickets or whatever they have, the Arizona Cardinals. Like, who cares about all those teams? This is this is different. Um, this is like you have the chance to be buried, you know, at St. Patrick's in New York. So um I would take it, uh, and and I'm interested in the feedback of of not taking it, uh, which there's some good arguments. Um, you could go against my family argument and say, this is going to disrupt Sundays. I just think you can manage that. I think you can be like, you pick three games, like in August. I'm going to this one, this one, this one. Maybe uh, definitely a Sunday night game, uh, which which will help. Maybe a Monday night game, but you avoid like, the noon Sunday. I think noon Sunday is controversial. You're like getting up, going to mass or going Saturday night. Yeah. So uh, anyways, I think there's a way to manage that as you have little kids. And then if it just doesn't work, you sell the tickets, but you, it's America. You can justify seats. anything, right? If you, I'm just going to say it's an investment and you know what, given the city, the economy, <laughs> now, it's, now we're in La yeah. La Land. <laughs> It's it's uh it's as it's not it won't do any worse than any of the other investments that anyone in America has right now. That is true. That is true. But 
I I have great memories of going to baseball games with my dad, football games, uh, definitely great memories taking my own kids to sporting events. We don't get to do it often because I'm very busy and we have a lot of kids. I just can't leave Mary Lisa all the time, but it is it is fun. Mary Lisa, and, I'll tell you something. I'll reveal something. For my birthday, which was a couple of weeks ago, Mary Lisa went behind my back, which was awesome, and got Astros tickets just for me and Mary Lisa. Sweet. Like, That's so great. We're going on an Astros date night because she knows like I would want to do that, right? But I'd have to like ask her and all that. And so she's surprised. I think it's the best gift she's ever given me, ever. That's awesome. Um, so, you know. They play the Bears once a year. That's one for Laura. Yeah. And and her family, maybe. This is this you're right. It brings families together. <laughs> this I can't afford not to do it. We're gonna end up singing Heal the World by Michael Jackson. <laughs> this case going because Steve got Packer tickets. <laughs> oh my word. And somehow uh we've got to get to Judas. Okay. Mm. That was great. Email podcast at 40 daysforlifecom I know my sister is a faithful listener and probably my sister's, I think, is the number one fan of Steve Carlin, um, which bewilders me in many ways. And we've discussed that. But she loves Steve Carlin and she thinks Steve is one of the funniest people. She's definitely going to be in the get the ticket, Steve. You All deserve right. it. So that's I know that'll be one vote. OK. And she has a lot of kids, so I'd be interesting in, in her feedback. If she, she, Maybe she'll – there's like 2% chance she's like, no way. She has five kids. When her kids were little, I don't know. She would have let her husband do it. So we'll we'll see. Get some feedback for you. Um, okay, so we mentioned this is the Fulton Sheen quote, which is the week that changed the world, and it should continue to change the world and to uh, change us. Um. So one of the things in here, Steve, that we're going to get started with is the fact that our Lord references hell 33 times in the gospel, even though hell doesn't exist, apparently, uh, for many people. It's just Hitler. He's in there alone in a one-bedroom apartment. Um, so there's only one person in hell, but hell is actually, if we reference Dante, and we'll reference him a couple of times, hell is cold. It's icy because it is without heat and without love. And God is often depicted as fire, uh, certainly the Holy Spirit. And I think people forget that the Holy Week journey is one out of coldness and the darkness of sin and into the warmth and the heart of Jesus Christ. Yeah, it's, it's true. Our, our, you know, Satan in his pride, he's trying to escape hell. His flapping of the wings is is cooling off uh, the the frigid temperatures of hell anymore, and trapping him in the case of ice. Um, I think this is I think this is true. I think it's a great analogy that Dante uses, and um, ultimately, we're made for love, and you just don't see that where there's ice. There's no tenderness. There's no compassion. There's no warmth. It's this dry, arid, chill to the bone cold that we see in the inferno and that's that's i think uh, what judas displayed i think that's what hell is like i think that's what betrayal is like these things all go together on holy week yeah and we're going to talk about uh a couple of things uh number one is the relationship uh, of uh the relationships that are betrayed by abortion betrayal is a big theme this week um no one wins an abortion except for bad men which is not good for anyone. So the relationships betrayed by abortion. Um, how Judas's motives in betraying the Lord line up with the motives of the abortion industry. So you uh -oh. guys are going to compare Judas to the abortion industry? Yes. Maybe. Yes, we are. <laughs> I think it is on the agenda, baby. So we are absolutely going to do that this Holy Week. Um, and then why... That betrayal, and this is the ultimate point of Holy Week and the ultimate point for all those who work in the abortion industry, why the betrayal is not actually the end. It is grave. It's a grave sin, 
but it doesn't have to be the end unless we allow it to be. So those are the three things we're going to cover. And first is the four relationships that are betrayed by abortion. And Steve, this is easy one. Number one, the relationship of doctor and patient. Yeah, we talked about this a little bit last week. You've got the the Hippocratic Oath. First, do no harm. And in the Hippocratic Oath, it even says, I will not you know, induce an abortion in the Hippocratic Oath. That, of course, has just been thrown out the window in many of the modern versions of the Hippocratic Oath. When you start to change the Hippocratic Oath because you disagree with it, you've basically just torn it up and thrown it out the window. And I think that's what we see has happened. But Doctors are healers. That doesn't seem like it should be something that needs to be said. But here we are saying it because abortion causes harm. And frankly, I'm not a big slippery slope argument guy. I think if you say something is wrong, it can be wrong without necessarily needing to get into like all the other wrong things that can follow. But the bottom line is this. Once we've accepted abortion, a whole lot more has come down the pipe. We've got euthanasia. We've got teenagers being mutilated because they're confused about gender. We've got all sorts of things in Canada now. They're they're starting to, to euthanize people. The, the medical assistance in dying program because um, you know people are sad or they, they've got non-terminal conditions or they're poor. They're killing the poor in Canada unbelievable. Uh, But it all, I think, began with sort of this crack in the door that we see where a doctor is willing to kill an innocent baby, uh, profit off of the mother in crisis. Uh, Anything goes after that. And you no longer have the ability, uh, in many cases, to put trust in your physician. Yeah. Over the last week, I've done a lot of interviews about this story in North Carolina, which is really good. This um, lawmaker in North Carolina proposed a law you have to propose these, even though it seems common sense, that abortion doctors have to report sex trafficking because there's a lot of uh, signs of sex trafficking. We report them at the vigils. We're not crazy where we're like, that boyfriend is a sex trafficker. But there are some obvious ones where we do train our local leaders how to report them, and we we report them. Uh, Planned Parenthood has had many scandals where they have not reported uh, coercion for abortion or sex trafficking, or minors having illegal abortions. And Lila Rose has done a great job exposing all that over the last decade. Um, So the abortion industry is not going to report sex trafficking. So this lawmaker is is proposing a bill that will force abortion doctors to report sex trafficking, which seems so obvious, right? All other physicians would do it. Um, teachers would do it if they suspected sex trafficking or child abuse or whatever. Um, And Planned Parenthood's been in trouble for covering up child abuse as well. So um, I've been interviewed about this a lot. And one thing that comes up is this divorce, this betrayal. Um, And one of the reasons the abortionists don't want to report it is because abortion's not between a woman and her doctor because he's not her doctor. As Dr. Haywood Robinson has said many times, like, I'm not her doctor. I don't know her. I don't know her name. She doesn't know who I am. She doesn't know my name. We're not from the same town. Many of these abortion, especially now that we have a huge shortage of abortion doctors in our country, in America, big elephant in the room in a post row America, they won't, they won't acknowledge that, nor should they. It's bad news. But many of these abortionists are in their 70s. They're washed up. They're angry baby boomers. Sorry to pick on the baby boomers again. But these younger doctors, even pro-choice ones, the millennials, uh, they don't want to do the abortions. They may sit back and say a woman should have right to an abortion or access, but they don't want to do it. There's a big difference. Big difference. So it's interesting you mentioned that, Sean, because... A number of years ago, I was out at my 40 Days for Life vigil, and there's a couple that goes in, and the the woman is clearly a girl, not a woman. And so they go in. There's nothing we can do to reach them. And immediately after, her friend comes out, the, this guy, and he says, "Look, I'm not I'm not the father of the child. I'm just her friend. But you know, I'm not I'm not pro abortion, and she doesn't really want the abortion, but she doesn't have a choice because her boyfriend is is an adult." And so I'm thinking, okay, so we've got a teenager here. We've got, she's not of the age of consent. And then you've got a a man who's by legal definition abusing her. So I called law enforcement. I said, I've got to, I've got to report this. And the law enforcement just kind of scoffed at me. They said, are you a mandatory reporter? I said, I don't know what that means. They're like, are you a mandatory? I I don't know. I don't know. Well, we can't really do anything about it. 
So I went home and I looked up the law on what is mandatory reporter and how do you handle child sex abuse in the state of Wisconsin. And there's an exception carved in. If you, It sounds like common sense. If you're a teacher, if you're a pastor, if you're a daycare person, anyone who has reason to believe that there's sexual abuse taking place, by law, you are required to report it or you're culpable, except there's a little carve out for sexual health providers. So Planned Parenthood in our state law no has way. an excuse. They're accepted and not required to report abuse. That's actually unbelievable. I had no idea. It's a definite betrayal. Well, they've had to have done that in other states. And for abortion, Wisconsin is still a middle-of-the-road state for politics in general. So they have it. I would assume many of the pro-abortion states have it. That's amazing. It's, It's a freedom to hide sex trafficking and abuse. Yeah. Get out, get, out of, get out of jail free card or plain monopoly. Get out of reporting. Yeah, get out of reporting yeah. sex abuse card. This monopoly game, they're collecting more than two hundred dollars, though. This is the evil monopoly game. Yeah, where yeah. everyone should be in jail. Um, oh my word, that's crazy, crazy. Yeah. Um, so that's that is a huge betrayal. Um, between the woman and her doctor, the doctors in medicine. Um, the Hippocratic Oath is out the window. I think that's just, I don't know if that's like the Ten Commandments now for like it is for most people, like where the Ten Commandments, it's like nice and there's a movie about it and it sounds dignified, the Ten Commandments, the Hippocratic Oath, you know, and everybody kind of reveres it, but you don't really follow it. It's just like whatever, it's like nice to have. It's part of the tradition. Um, I don't know if it's like that or because there are, Thousands of doctors who have brought this up publicly and legislatively. Doctors can't do abortions because of the Hippocratic Oath. And it's like, ah. And many of them don't, as I just referenced. Many of them don't. Most doctors would absolutely never do an abortion. And I know Dr. Haywood Robinson used to be on the uh, admissions board for the medical school at Texas A&M University. And he asked a question, and they told him you're not allowed to ask it, but he asked it anyways. It's like you can't ask a Supreme Court justice nominee, would you overturn Roe v. Wade, or would you uphold Roe? You're not allowed to ask that. Haywood asked the medical version of that, which is, would you ever do an abortion? And um, many of them said no. And he said, we need to know that. We need to know as doctors, are we letting somebody in who's going to openly violate the Hippocratic Oath? So you weren't supposed to ask. Haywood asked. Shocker. But, good for him. Um, good for him. But absolutely, don't you want to know if your doctor is willing to do an abortion or not? And 99% of them aren't. That's not why people get into medicine. The abortionist has been sued. He needs cash. He had a personal scandal, a divorce. He had a professional scandal, a malpractice lawsuit. It's never the plan. It's been the plan for like one of them. It wasn't even Bernard Nathanson's plan. He kind of stumbled into abortion. So... Um, it's, it's pretty remarkable. Okay. The second relationship that it betrays is men and women. Abortion is that divide the man no longer looking out for you. Whatever you decide, I will support you. The most useless and dangerous statement of our modern era. And certainly the woman who wants, if you have a choice, You have the choice. This is a normal procedure, just like you see on the YouTube page right now. Abortion is a medical procedure that occurs all the time and everybody's happy. And so then you do it and you regret it and you're the woman and you're like, I don't know if that was the right thing. And everybody says, well, at least you had the choice and you're on your own. So if you regret your abortion, you're a woman. Forget you. Yeah, it's this. We've seen this bro choice movement too, like these frat boy type of guys, where they're they're kind of making the case openly. Like this is the thing you don't really say out loud. Like maybe you joke about it with your friends. It wouldn't be acceptable. I'm not condoning that by any means, but the the things that people are comfortable saying out loud have increasingly surprised me. And there's this bro choice movement where these guys are saying, "Look, she's not going to have an abortion. Just leave her, saddle her, her with the kid." Uh, It's a form of coercion. It's maybe not a violent form of coercion, but it's a form of coercion. And um, 
it's uh, it's just despicable. I, I think women should be able to count on men to have their best interests at heart. Men and women are made for each other. Uh, you know, adults and children are made for each other. There's a mutual uh, obligations and responsibilities between men and women, and men are just abdicating here. They have betrayed women. And it's no wonder that we see such confusion and such animosity between the sexes now. Um, you know, even the whole transgender craze. I was reading an interesting take on it, which suggests that. Um, you know, huge, just massive numbers of of Gen Z young women and girls are declaring themselves, you know, men or non-binary or whatever other gender they've made up. And in one in, in some senses, it's it's I'm sympathetic to it because they've looked and they've seen the betrayal of men against women. And they said, if that's what being a woman entails, I don't want any part of it. I agree. There's a more dangerous element to Generation Z, and we're going to cover this later a little bit, but I'll plant the seed. When you deny your own sex, because there aren't 200 genders. I know that's just a, an astonishing Hate speech. These days. Hate speech. There's not. You can say there is. You can have surgery. You can, you can If you're a boy, you can actually never be a girl. So you're, it, it's not like, don't tell me I can never climb Mount Everest. It's not that. They want you to think it is. It's not that. Um, it's that you will never be 100 feet tall. It's just not happening. So you cannot be a girl if you're born a boy. Once you convince yourself you can be and you go out on this endless pursuit that is destined to fail, What's it? What what it is based on is your rejection of your own self, of your own beautiful identity uh, that you were given. You don't sign up for it. You weren't assigned it at birth. No one assigned you anything. It's not homework in the third grade. It's not your multiplication tables that you're assigned. It is given to you. If you're an atheist, it's given to you by Mother Earth. It's biology. It's science. Forget. Let's forget God. But it's given to you. You didn't. You, there wasn't multiple choice. Your parents didn't even have a multiple choice. So you're born, a, you're born a boy. When you say, no, I'm not, I'm a girl, you're rejecting yourself. You're dehumanizing yourself. You're trying to. You ultimately can't, which makes the whole process more frustrating. So you're attacking your own dignity. That's why the trans movement is so uh, different. Like we can look at an unborn child we can look at a Jew. We can look at slavery. We can look at these different groups of people that history has looked at and said, you are not like us. You don't have our dignity. You are subhuman. And we can get rid of those people. That's from the outside. The trans movement is from within. It's saying, I am not who I am. And not like, hey, I'm Buddhist and I'm converting to Judaism or I'm Mormon and I'm becoming a Baptist. It's not that. It's your basic biology down to your bones, your identity you are rejecting. And there's the goofy part of it, which, which deserves laughter, which is the boys. It's a man's world, baby. The boys are winning all the more, the women's sports. The boys are getting the women of the year award. You know, there's all the goofy stuff. Um, that just shows how much our world hates women and women just think they're being loved on. They're not. <laughs> the trans movement is a man's movement, let me tell you. Um, but beyond all that, that's kind of the silly part. It's absolute garbage. It's total nonsense. Like it's total nonsense to say that you're a boy and that you're a girl. You're our boy and you're you're saying you're a girl so you can go into the girl's restroom. It's It's total nonsense. Nonsense. It's not accurate in any way. It's it's a it's a uh, mental disorder, and the dangerous part, Steve, is that it's a rejection of self. It's a rejection of your own identity, and in that comes this tremendous pain and confusion that we're just ignoring. And the suicide rates are through the roof, absolutely through the roof. We want to ignore that, or we want to say, well, it's because society is so intolerant of them that they have to kill themselves without looking at all, at all, 
at the ramifications of all of a sudden trying to convince yourself that you're something that you're not. And Steve, if you if you came back here with your Packer tickets and you said, Sean, I made the plunge and we're going to the Cowboy Packer game. And I'm like, oh man, this is awesome. And I fly up there and we get to the game and you turn to me and you say, um, Sean, I'm Bart Starr. There is no Steve and you need to call me Bart. We got problems. We got to leave the game. I'm not, I'm taking away. I'm not buying you a bratwurst and we've got to go get you help. The problem is that in that scenario, our society is looking at Steve going, all right, Bart, boy, the ice bowl was something, wasn't it? You know, and, and we're confirming this error and we're confirming the mental illness and we're confirming you know all the, t- the the signs that people talk about, like your kids drawing pictures, or you see these movies where you're like, the kid's not having this normal behavior. We see this with the school shooters. Everybody's like, yeah, he was odd. He was out there. I didn't want to say anything, but he was a nut. And he had all these like brutal, nasty, bloody posters in his room of people getting mutilated. And I just thought he was, I don't know, into video games. You know, we we recognize those signs, but somebody walks up and says, you know, that they're Thomas Jefferson. And we're like, hey, Tom, how's it going? Thanks for all you did for our country. Uh, You own slaves. You're not that great. You know, I mean, we start treating them like they're Thomas Jefferson. And it's very, very dangerous. And that is unique to the trans movement right now. Yeah, another form of betrayal for sure. It's just, we get away from the truth and everything falls apart. Everything. There's not, you can't kind of have partial truths. You either have the truth or you have, have a lie. And we're choosing to live by lies right now in our culture. Uh, the next one is is beautiful and therefore the most sad. Um, I saw a reflection recently, Steve, and it was really amazing. And you and I have wonderful wives and wonderful children. And um, we know this to be true, but the, the reflection uh, was by a priest and it was on how no one on earth no no one on earth is can love you like your own mother it is one of the most unique relationships that we have probably the most unique you know our moms brought us into the world they changed your first diaper um there's just this they fed you there's this intimacy of a mother loving her child. It's one of the beautiful things about Christmas. You see the Holy Family everywhere. You see the nativity everywhere. Um, but there's also just the natural law of you you see a mom, you know, struggling to take care of her kid in the grocery store or at church or uh, playing with her kid on an airplane. Uh, I love seeing moms fly with with babies, you know. I also try to help them because if somebody's like glaring at them because they have a child, I want to, you know, like attack that person. So um, it's just beautiful. No one will love you like your mother. No one can. It's a very unique relationship. And this is the great sadness. And I don't think you can fully understand it until you spend a lot of time or listen to a lot of women who have had an abortion and the immense pain that comes with that. When you betray that relationship between a mother and a child, it's the most beautiful bond in our humanity. And that makes abortion the most tragic, the, the biggest tragedy in our culture because it's, it's many of them are confused or some of them aren't, you know, they're culpable. But women going in and having their own children aborted, we've already discussed the men, they're often nowhere to be found, they're gone. So shame on them. They're definitely culpable. But the mothers going through with it, that is unlike any betrayal of any relationship. Uh, it's the most unnatural. You hear these stories of women who all of a sudden can you know, push their car over the railroad tracks because their infant is sitting in the car and the train's coming. Um, there's all of these heroic examples. We would do anything for our children. And that makes this betrayal, I think, the most tragic. It really is because as unique as that mother-child relationship is, it's also universal. Every human being has a mother. And I think that's where we get into some of this is we have a time in our world where 
there is so much pride and vanity. And so rather than celebrating the things that we have in common, we're trying to scratch our way to the top, claw our way to the top, you know, achieve, 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 you know, put others below us and us above others. And, you know, you're going to become like the secretary general of the UN, or you're going to be the one that cures cancer. You're going to be the one that changes the world. And ultimately, I think that leads people to frown upon motherhood because anybody can do it. Now, obviously, there's exceptions. Some people, this natural infertility or whatnot, but generally anybody can do it. And so we look down upon it with disdain, even though it's common to all of humanity. And this is where we get into it in in what to say when, and we just dismiss the argument. You know, what about if there's a a violin player and the violin player kidnaps you and uses your kidney function and you're tied to the violin player. Like it's such a betrayal there because like, wait, okay. That's a mildly interesting thought experiment, I suppose, except for why are you comparing a mother and a child to a violinist in a hostage taking situation where someone's tied up for their kidney function. This isn't this isn't a hostage situation. You know, we talk, we see uh, you know the unborn child referred to as a parasite. We see the mothers are like, I'm not just an incubator. I mean, you're right on that front. You're not just an incubator. This is the most intimate relationship in the human experience, and it is a betrayal of it to suggest that you can just sort of discard it, unwanted intruder, parasite, hostage taken violin player. It's insane. And it, this is where it is so sad. And this is where, you know, as you mentioned, some women know what they're doing and I suppose they're culpable. And in other cases, there's abortion industry propagandists who are betraying mothers by deluding them in a moment of crisis into believing that that their own child is something akin to an intruder. And because some of the listeners or viewers may say it's ridiculous, no one's ever called the unborn child the parasite, I'll reference it. It is uh, Dr. Lever Carhart, late-term abortion doctor in Nebraska. He, in a 60 Minutes interview, called uh, the child the parasite, and I put it in my book, The Beginning of the End of Abortion. So that is how they have to be viewed. Uh, that's part of the betrayal medicine on his part. But um, no one, Steve, wants to talk about the fallout of an abortion that it has on a woman. And and for men, you and I are kind of cut off from this to a certain level, to a big level, because we can't understand, uh, because we can't have children, um, and it's 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 one of the great gifts that women have. It's a miracle. Men can't do it. I mean, they're like, well, you can't get pregnant. Yeah, I know. <laughs> you can't. Like that's a good thing. Um, so instead, I'll just say that I'm a, a woman and I'll take over swimming, you know, and win all your awards. But the whole notion that we wouldn't know are the post abortive women who have told us, and 25% of 40 Days for Life leaders are post abortive women. Can't go down. Many of them struggled for years going down the baby aisle, holding a newborn. And how sad. And I've witnessed that before. I've witnessed a woman unwilling to hold a baby because of her abortion. Um, they don't think about that. And that's the betrayal of this relationship. And so that's why also we're there before, during, and after the abortion. Post-abortive healing is such a huge part of what we do at 40 Days for Life. And we'll always do it. And it's needed. We are the first person, and you're the first person, if you go out, that they see minutes after their abortion. I mean, what you say, what you don't say, your body language, they remember that forever. And that's why so many of them uh, find hope and healing and and are able to be set free. And we'll get to that later. Um, okay, the next betrayal, public servants and the people they serve. This is at an all-time high. These idiots running around saying, I'll pay for your abortion if you come to my state. I mean, good night. Talk about sprinting on the uh, to, to the... Can you imagine recruiting plantation owners in the South? To Minnesota or California saying, come out here, baby. We'll give you all the slaves you want. That's what they're doing. <laughs> so we're a harsh for, judge of history. And they're doing it to, this is like doing it not in 19, I'm sorry, not in 1840, but in 1870. Like, yeah, Roe is gone. Get with the program, get with the times. You know, it's like- uh, you, you And a lot of see... politicians thought it was, <laughs> thought that the emancipation was a mistake. A lot of politicians are like, this is a disaster. You know, what are these slaves going to do? We need to go back. Yeah. So for all the talk, you know, I I never think that like the year is an indicator of truth. Like, of course you got to be a feminist. It's 2023. 
But if there's a time to make that argument, it's actually on our side. It's 2023. Roe is gone. Get with the times. We've got ultrasound. We've got science. We've got technology. We've got the means to provide for a woman in crisis in any situation. These guys are are out to lunch, and they, they betray on all sides of the aisle. Uh, you know, we talked about President Biden once voted for a constitutional amendment to overturn Roe v. Wade. Bill Clinton took a pro-life stance at one point. Jesse Jackson, Ted Kennedy, you can go all throughout throughout that party. And then you've got Republicans who claim to be pro-life. They campaign on being pro-life, and then they run for the hills the moment they're called to take a tough stand, too. Uh, maybe this is where I mentioned the 2017 Republican Congress that failed to defund Planned Parenthood. And I, I think betrayal is an interesting, as we talk about Judas here, betrayal is an interesting sort of type of sin because it becomes personal. You know, it's one thing if you, um, you know, you, you're you not chaste, but you're not married, but, but you, you commit a sin against chastity. Like, that's bad. You've got to deal with it. You've got to make it right with God. But then, like, adultery takes on a whole new level because you're betraying your spouse. There's a reason why you know, a quarter of a millennium later, we're still using Benedict Arnold as a a pejorative. There's a reason why we're doing this podcast about Judas, because everybody knows he was a betrayer. Betrayal, I think, takes on a particular, uh, there's a particular disgust associated with it because it's so vicious. And that's what I think we see from a lot of these politicians. That's why, you know, Justice Sonia Sotomayor, not my favorite justice. I think she's probably my least favorite justice. And yet we don't (laughs) spend as much time ripping on her as we do on John Roberts because John Roberts knew it was right. And he betrayed. Yeah, exactly. And so do my, your just doesn't know what she's talking about with abortion. I mean, she's the one that compared the baby to a brain dead person. If you remember that. So, um, bad memory. Um, yeah. So politicians completely betrayed, completely betrayed. And it's, it's, um, very, very dangerous. Very, very dangerous. Okay, so let's compare all those people to Judas, because that's what this podcast is for. Um, Enter Judas. Um, No one names their kid Judas anymore, Steve. I think this kind of died after his his, uh, 30 pieces of silver. Um, But just start by giving us the two reasons in Scripture that Judas decides to betray our Lord. Yeah, there's a lot of speculation on why did he do it. Well, there could be a variety of reasons, but scripture tells us two of them. The first is that he was greedy. He got those 30 pieces of silver that you referenced. And we also know from John's gospel that, you know, he was, it wasn't just like, oh, I screwed up. You know, along the way, he was stealing the contributions that were intended for the poor. So this is a greedy guy. He's not doing the right thing. And, uh, you know, to compare it here, uh, you know, we need to pray for abortion workers and abortion doctors, but Dr. Haywood Robinson has said, look, I, I didn't get into abortion because I thought I was advancing women's health and I was misguided. He said, I, I like the money. And that's a big part of abortion is the betrayal to get that paycheck. CVS and Walgreens, I'll throw them in there. Mm, yeah, good like, one. Why, why would they do this? They're publicly traded. Their stock's going down. Um, why would they do this? And it's it's money. They, they think it's going to help their bottom line. Um, and then, so all of us are Judas because we all betray our Lord through sin. Um, but the devil has a role in our temptations and certainly had a role, um, in Judas. And once Satan entered into Judas, uh, we read in Luke 22, uh, three through four, then Satan entered Judas called Iscariot, one of the 12. And Judas went to the chief priests and the officers of the temple guard and discussed with them how he might betray Jesus. So once he takes the temptation from the devil, it's followed by the act. Um, That's a bolder statement than I think we sometimes realize. I mean, it says right there, Satan entered Judas. That kind of should make us tremble a little bit. And and the spiritual life, you know, a good spiritual direction. It's a, a a spiritual director will tell you it's all it's it's fantasy, illusion, stupidity. Fantasy is the initial thought that's in your head that's not a sin. I could do that. I should do that. Maybe I'll do that. Uh, illusion is the fact that it could actually work out, and for your for you that it'll make you happy. That's an illusion. And then stupidity is the actual committing of the sin. So fantasy, illusion, stupidity that follows all how sin is is made. And that's how the devil gets you. 
And that's, um, you know, what we see in, in Luke 22. Uh, recently, though, on the podcast, it's episode season eight, episode nine. We discuss how abortion is a satanic ritual. And sadly, shockingly, comically, abortion advocates aren't hiding it anymore. And Steve, <laughs> Steve Carlin has one of the funniest lines I've ever heard of him say, because I was uh, uh when we recorded, I laughed. And then when I watched the recording, I laughed when Steve said, you know, we live in a world where traditionally Satan is considered the bad guy. <laughs> and the fact that you had to say that on a podcast for clarity is funny and tragic all at the same time. Um, okay, so skipping ahead, that's enough of Judas. Why did Judas betray Jesus? Um, one of the reasons... It, following that is that judas tries to play god he tries to completely control the entire situation and abortion is built on control it's built on all you get is the bad reasons the kid will grow up to be handicapped the kid will grow up to be poor the kid will grow up to be a minority the kid will uh there is going to be unwanted which is the biggest mortal sin in our culture these days um the everything is bad Everything is awful. We must control it. We must control it, and um, that that can get us into a into a lot of trouble when we fail to acknowledge the sovereignty of God and something outside of ourselves that we should follow. Because then we just follow self, and that will always lead to dehumanization. The good news, Steve: betrayal is not the final word. Yeah, and that's a case where, as we're recording this, I'm wondering, am I am I being too judgmental here, calling everybody involved with abortion Judas? Maybe I don't know. I guess I've got to examine my conscience about that. But here's where we soften it a little bit. With the I called us Judas too. I, I threw us. That's in there true. You Judas. did. You did. <laughs> uh, but I'll own up to that as well. And and this is where we this week becomes all the more powerful as we see betrayal is not not the final word. It's not the end of the story. Uh, you know, Pope Benedict XVI has a great quote. Even Judas' betrayal became, through divine providence, the occasion for Jesus' supreme act of love for the salvation of the world, end quote. And there was hope for Judas. He could have repented and our Lord would have forgiven him, but he chose to despair, which was the greater sin than uh, than even betraying our Lord, that he refused to accept the forgiveness that was there waiting for him. And we've got... We've got the counterexample to that, which is Judas maybe was the most notable in betrayal of the Lord during the Passion because he's the one who turned the Lord over to those who killed him ultimately. Uh, but he wasn't the only betrayal. I mean, from the Garden of Gethsemane, you see Peter and James and John in the Lord's hour fall asleep repeatedly. They're snoozing on him. And then not long after that, Peter denies him not once, not twice, but three times right after the Lord said, you're going to do this. And he said, no, I'm not. He did it anyway. And then the passion comes, the the way of the cross, the crucifixion, and the, the, Judas is gone. Ten of them are on the run. Only John sticks around. So all of the disciples, except for, for John and for the women, they fly the coop and they're gone. That's a form of betrayal of our Lord. And yet all of them are honored. All of them are heroes of the faith, fathers of the faith not because of their own merits, but because they accepted the forgiveness that the Lord had to offer even after they let him down. And that, that should bring us hope for those who have been wounded by the sin of abortion. There's hope. There's hope, and we should rejoice in it. There is hope. And I, you know, you going through that, and I'm sure the listener, the viewer is thinking the same thing. It's just the perfect week to watch The Passion of the Christ. The Passion of the Christ is not like an every Saturday night movie. Um, obviously, but it's definitely a Lent movie, a once a year movie, a, a Holy Week movie, and a great time, a beautiful piece of art uh, that takes us through these these events with our Lord. And um, for the record, they're making the sequel called The Resurrection that I believe comes out in 2024. It um, feels like it's... they've been making that for about five years. I hope it mm. actually comes out next year. They have, and when Mel Gibson was in Father Stew, there was an interview with him and Mark Wahlberg, and the reporter just wanted to talk to Mel Gibson about the resurrection. 
Um, yeah. <laughs> and they said, they said what you said, like, isn't this taking a while? And he goes, it is. It's taken me seven years because you can't screw this up. <laughs> okay. You know, like this has to be done right. Cause it's the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So anyways, um, they definitely didn't screw up the passion and it's so well done that we definitely recommend watching that this week. Um, and and using that as a as a as motivation uh, to fight against our own sins, to strive for holiness, and to offer to take our Lord up on the mercy that we ourselves need, but also the mercy required in the abortion industry. I mean, we went through all of this. This isn't a relative subject. Um, abortion is killing babies, and there are many souls involved in that, and we have got to offer them. The mercy of Christ. That's the only ultimate healing you can have. And we've seen it with the post abortive workers. We've seen it with or with the abortion workers. We've seen it with the post abortive women and the true healing that can take place, but that is absolutely required because participating in abortion or having an abortion and and not repenting or not getting healing is hell. It is hell. And you want to talk about you know, the devil is chained on earth, but he's unchained in hell. I mean, he has a field day with accusing. He is tempter and accuser, and he beats these women down. You killed your baby. You're useless. You're nothing. Uh, and the doctors, too. I mean, many of them have just completely sold out. And and But it's not too late. They They need to return and to take our Lord up on his mercy. I think it's hard being an abortion doctor and convincing yourself, convincing yourself that you're doing a good thing, but then convincing yourself that you're redeemable. Cause that that's at the, at the, at the bottom of all abortionists is despair. It's all despair. It's ultimately just, you have to completely sell your soul to despair. This is the good that I'm doing is killing a baby and telling the woman it's good for her. I mean, they are at the lowest point of, of human life and existence as far as their psychosis and their emotions. And I've seen it. I've seen it. I mean, it's not enough to say they're depressed. I mean, they are sad, sad people and they don't think that they're redeemable. So we have to offer the love and the freedom and the joy of Christ to them. And uh, that's what Holy Week is all about. What a beautiful time. It's a great time. <clears throat> we have a lot going on. At 40 Days for Life, we have a lot of big announcements coming over the next few months. We have a big announcement coming in like two weeks <clears throat> as of the uh, release of this podcast. So big announcement. It's substantive. It's not Steve's Packer tickets, but it's close to that. Um, and speaking of that, to close out this beautiful Holy Week podcast as we fight the devil, email us at podcast at 40daysforlife.com to tell us your humble solicited opinion should steve get the packer tickets or shouldn't he steve is there a deadline what's the deadline on this april 14th they do not leave dun, dun, you dun. a lot of time it's like right around tax time that's kind of ironic you could just not pay taxes steve and have that on your conscience and use that money to give to the packers think about it <laughs> Everything is on the table. Okay. All right. Please rate. I'm not saying I will. I'm not saying I won't. That's a, yeah, yeah. Whatever's good for you, baby. All right. (laughs) Please rate, review, and share this podcast, and we will see you next time. God bless you.